Chapter Number Eight of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. An Indictment of Intercollegiate Athletics by William T. Foster. Intercollegiate athletics provide a costly, injurious, and excessive regime of physical training for a few students, especially those who need it least, instead of inexpensive, healthful, and moderate exercise for all students, especially those who need it most. Athletics are conducted either for education or for business. The old distinction between amateur and professional athletics is of little use. The real problems of college athletics loom large beside the considerations that define our use of the terms professional and amateur. The aims of athletics reveal the fact that the important distinctions are between athletics conducted for educational purposes and athletics conducted for business purposes. When athletics are conducted for education, the aims are 1. to develop all the students and faculty physically and to maintain health, 2. to promote moderate recreation in the spirit of joy and as a preparation for study, rather than as a substitute for study, and three, form habits and inculcate ideas of right living. When athletics are conducted for business, the aims are, one, to win games, to defeat another person or group being the chief end, two, to make money, as it is impossible otherwise to carry on athletics as business, three, to attain individual or group fame and notoriety, these three, which are the controlling aims of intercollegiate athletics, are also the aims of horse racing, prize fighting, and professional baseball. These two sets of aims are in sharp and almost complete conflict. Roughly speaking, success in attaining the aims of athletics as education is in inverse proportion to success in attaining the aims of athletics as business. Intercollegiate athletics today are for business. The question is pertinent whether schools and colleges should promote athletics as business. Nearly all that may be said on this subject about colleges applies to secondary schools. The lower schools, as a rule, tend to imitate the worst features of intercollegiate athletics, much as the young people of fraternities, in their social functions, tend to imitate the empty lives of their elders that fill the weary society columns of the newspapers. If the objection arises that intercollegiate athletics have educational value, there is no one to deny it. Athletics for education and athletics for business are general terms, used throughout this discussion as already defined. Exceptions there may be, only the main tendencies are here set forth. The whole discussion is based on my personal observations at no less than 100 universities and colleges in 38 states during the past five years. The most obvious fact is that our system of intercollegiate athletics, after unbounded opportunity to show what it can do for the health, recreation, and character of all our students, has proved a failure. The ideal of the coach is excessive training of the few. He best attains the business ends for which he is hired by the neglect of those students in greatest need of physical training. Our present system encourages most students to take their athletics by proxy. When we quote with approval the remark of the Duke of Wellington that Waterloo was won on the playing grounds of Eton, we should observe that he did not maintain that Waterloo was won on the grandstands of Eton. What athletics may achieve without the hindrance of intercollegiate games and business motives is suggested by the experience of Reed College. There the policy of athletics for everybody was adopted five years ago, before there were any teachers, students, alumni, or traditions. Last year, all but six of the students took part in athletics in the spirit of sport for the sake of health, recreation, and development. Sixty percent of the men of the college, including the faculty, took part in a schedule of 16 baseball games. Nearly all the students, men and women alike, played games at least twice a week. There were a series of contests in football, baseball, track, tennis, volleyball, basketball, and other out-of-door sports. All of this, according to the report of the Athletic Association, cost the students an average of 16 cents apiece. No money for coaches and trainers. No money for badges, banners, cups, and other trinkets. No money for training tables and railroad fares. 
No money for grandstands, rallies, brass bands, and advertising. Fortunately, it is the unnecessary expenses that heap up the burdens. The cost of athletics is business. The economical policy is athletics for everybody, athletics for education. Opposed to the three educational aims are the aims of athletics as business, winning games, making money, and getting advertised. Almost invariably, the arguments of students in favor of intercollegiate games stress the business aims and ignore all others. Win games, increase the gate receipts, advertise the college. These are the usual slogans. Thus the editors of one college paper reprimand the faculty for even hesitating to approve a trip of 1,500 miles for a single game of football. Contrary to the expectations of the students, the matter of the Occidental football game for next fall has not been acted upon as yet. That such an important matter as this has not received attention so far from the faculty is unfortunate. While it is generally believed that the faculty will act favorably in regard to letting the game be scheduled, it is understood that some opposition has developed on the ground that such a long trip would keep the football men away from their classes too long a time. From every point of view, there seems no reason why the game should not be played. To state any of the arguments in favor of the offer is unnecessary. Everyone knows what it would mean to football next fall, the greater interest it would mean to the game, the incentive it would prove to every football man to work to become one of the seventeen men to take the trip, the advertising it would give to the college, and perhaps most important, the drawing card it would be to bring new athletes to the college in the fall. These points and others are too well known to need pointing out, and too evident to need proof. This is a typical football argument. It attempts to prove the necessity of the proposed trip by showing that it would tend to perpetuate the thing the value of which is under dispute. In like vein, the students of Cornell complain because the faculty did not grant an additional holiday in connection with the Pennsylvania football game. It is the familiar cry, support the team, win games, advertise the college. Our friends, the professors, will perforce hold forth in their accustomed cells from eight till one of that fair morning. The benches, no doubt, will derive great benefit therefrom. We want the football team to have as much support as possible. The faculty should want the football team to have as much support as possible. The faculty should foster true Cornell spirit whenever it can honestly do so. And intercollegiate athletics is the greatest single thing that unites the different colleges into Cornell University. A victory over Penn would mean a lot for Cornell. After all, how important is this inn for which such sacrifices are made? To hear the yelling of 20,000 spectators, one might suppose this aim to be the only one of great importance in the life of the university. Yet who wins, who loses, is a matter of but momentary concern to any except a score or two of participants. Whereas if there is one thing that should characterize a university, it is his cheerful sacrifice of temporary for permanent gains. In Dr. Eliot's fine phrase, its devotion to the durable satisfactions of life. The making of money through intercollegiate athletics continues a curse not only to institutions but as well to individual players. Only childlike innocence or willful blindness need prevent American colleges from perceiving that the rules which aim to maintain athletics on what is called an amateur basis by forbidding players to receive pay in money, are worse than useless. For while failing to prevent men from playing for pay, they breed deceit and hypocrisy. There are many ways of paying players for their services. Only one of these, and that is the most honorable, is condemned. There are many subterranean passages leading to every preparatory school notable for its athletes. By such routes, coaches, overzealous alumni, and other friends of a college reach the schoolboy athlete with offers beyond the scope of eligibility rules. Sometimes payments are made expressly for services as halfback, or shortstop, or hurdler, and no receipts taken, the pay continuing as long as a player helps to win games. Sometimes payments take a more insidious and more demoralizing form, the star athlete is appointed steward of a college clubhouse on ample pay, his duties being to sign checks once a month, or his college expenses are paid in return for the labor of opening the chapel door, or ringing the bell, or turning out the lights. 
athletes may be paid for their services in other ways that escape the notice of the most conscientious faculties and athletic associations. But there are hundreds of boys who know that they are paid to win games and keep silent. They are hired both as athletes and as hypocrites. The sporting editor of one of the leading daily newspapers said recently, It is well known that the Northwest colleges are at present simply outbidding one another in their desire to get the best athletics. Money is used like water. It is a mystery where they get it, but they do. So common is the practice of paying athletes that they sometimes apply to various colleges for bids. While I was acting as registrar of Bowdoin College, I received a letter from a man asking how much we would guarantee to pay him for pitching on the College Nine. I found out later that he had registered at one college, pitched a game for his class team, left his trunk at a second college awaiting their terms, and finally accepted the offer of a third college, where he played amateur baseball for four years before joining one of the big league professional teams. At the athletic rallies of a New England college, a loyal alumnus is often cheered for bringing so many star athletes to the college. Officially, the college does not know that he hires men to play on the college teams. And what is to prevent a graduate of the college or any other person from hiring athletes? All but futile are the rules governing professionalism. Is it not a worthy act to enable a boy to go to college? And shall he be denied such aid because he happens to be an athlete? No eligibility committee knows of all these benefactors, or even has the right to question their motives. But the objectionable motives themselves can be eliminated by one act. The abolition of intercollegiate athletics. With the subordination of winning games as the chief end in athletics, falls also the money-making aim and its attendant evils. All the serious evils of college athletics center about the gate receipts, the grandstand and the paid coach. Yet the aim of nearly every college appears to be to fasten these evils upon the institution by means of a costly concrete stadium or bowl, and by means of more and more money for coaches. When the alumni come forward to support their team, they usually make matters worse. Typical of their attitude is a letter signed in Philadelphia last fall by some thirty graduates of a small college. The team has just closed the most disastrous season in its history. The alumni will cooperate cheerfully with the undergraduates in increasing the football levy. It only remains, then, to initiate a campaign for procuring the money. We must depart from our time-worn precedents and give more money for the coaches. Alumni are tired of reading the accounts of useless defeats. The extent to which interest in athletics is deadened by paid coaches was shown last spring when a track team from one university after traveling over 250 miles, at the expense of the student body, to compete with the team of another institution, took off their running shoes and went home, because the coaches could not agree on the number of men who should participate in the games. Could there be a more abject sacrifice of the educational purpose of athletics? Consider the spectacle. A glorious afternoon in spring. A perfect playground. Complete equipment and readiness. Two score of eager youth in need of the health and recreation that come from sport pursued in the fine spirit of sport. Could anything keep them from playing? Nothing but the spirit of modern American intercollegiate athletics, and the embodiment of that spirit, the paid coach, who knows that there is but one crime that he can commit, that of losing a contest. The athletic policy of many an institution is determined by a commercial aim. The supposed needs of advertising, much as the utterances of many a newspaper, are dictated by the business manager. But does the advertising gain through intercollegiate athletics, injure or aid, a college? At one railroad station I was greeted by a real estate agent who offered to sell me, on easy terms, a lot in the most beautiful and rapidly growing city in America. Thus do I safely cover its identity. Among the attractions, he mentioned, the local college. He was proud of it. He said it had the best baseball team in the state. Apart from that, he had not an intelligent idea about the institution, or any desire for ideas. The only building he had visited was the grandstand. He could not name a member of the faculty or a course of instruction. College advertising, which gets no further than this, is paid for at exorbitant rates. 
The people of Tacoma discovered recently that college athletics conducted as a business are too costly. They brought college students 1,400 miles to play a football game at Tacoma on Thanksgiving Day for the benefit of the Belgian refugees. The charitable object of the game was widely advertised, and there was a large attendance. After they had paid the expenses of the amateur teams, the coaches, and the advertising, they announced that there was nothing left for the Belgians. A writer in the North American Review tries to justify the time spent by college boys in managing athletic teams on the plea that it is good training for business. He gives testimony to this effect from a graduate of two years standing, engaged in the wholesale coal business in one of the large New York towns. Following the usual custom, this young graduate returns to his college and gives the admiring undergraduates the benefit of his wisdom lest they be corrupted by the quaint notions of impractical professors. He has them guess what part of his college work has proved of greatest use. Then he assures them that his best training came as manager of the baseball team. Such is the mature judgment of the coal dealer, and such is the advice of alumni, which makes undergraduates resolve anew not to allow their studies to interfere with their college education. But some people raise the question, why a boy should be maintained in college for four years, at a great cost to society and to his parents, in order that he may gain a little business experience when he could gain so much more by earning his living. The conflicts frequently arising between faculties and students over questions of intercollegiate athletics are the natural outcome of the independent control of a powerful agency with three chief aims, winning games, making money, and getting advertised which are antagonistic to the chief legitimate ambitions of a university faculty. No self-respecting head of a department of psychology would tolerate the presence in the university of persons working in his field, in no way subject to him and with aims subversive of those of the department. No professor of physical education should tolerate a similar condition in his department. It is one of the hopeful signs in America that several of the men best qualified to conduct athletics as education have declined to consider university positions, unless they could have control of students, teams, coaches, alumni committees, grandstands, fields, finances, and everything else necessary to rescue athletics from the clutches of commercialism. I have read a letter from one of the ablest teachers in America declining to accept a certain university position under the usual conditions, but outlining a plan whereby, as the real head of the Department of Physical Education, he might begin a new chapter in the history of American athletics. His plan was rejected, not because it had any defects as a system of education, but solely because it would cause a probable decline in victories, gate receipts, and newspaper space. That university continued the traditional dual contest of coaches and physical directors with their conflicting ideals. Recently I received a letter from the professor of physical education who did accept the position himself one of the ablest athletes among its graduates, declaring that he would no longer attempt the impossible in an institution which deliberately prostituted athletics for commercial ends. We hear much about the value of intercollegiate games for the tired businessman who needs to get out of doors and watch a sport that will make him forget his troubles. It is true that for him a game of baseball might be a therapeutic spectacle. The question is whether institutions of learning should conduct their athletics, or any other department, for the benefit of spectators. Doubtless, university courses in history could provide recreation for the general public and make money, if instruction were given wholly by means of motion pictures. But such courses would hardly satisfy the needs of all students. Is it less important that departments of physical education should be conducted primarily for all students, rather than for spectators? We do not insist that banks, railroads, factories, department stores, and legislatures jeopardize their main functions in order to provide recreation for the tired businessmen. Universities are institutions of equal importance to society in so far as they attend to their main purposes. Athletics, for the benefit of the grandstand, must be conducted as business. Athletics, for the benefit of the students, must be considered as education. It is when we rightly estimate the possibilities of athletics as education that the present tyranny of athletics as business becomes intolerable. Is it not an anomaly that those in charge of higher institutions of learning should leave athletic activities, which are of such great potential educational value for all students, 
chiefly under the control of students, alumni, coaches, newspapers, and spectators. Usually the coach is engaged by the students, paid for by the students, and responsible only to them. He is not a member of the faculty, or responsible to the faculty. The faculty have charge of the college as an educational institution. Athletics is for business and therefore separately controlled. Why not abandon faculty direction of Latin? Students, alumni, and newspapers are as well qualified to elect a professor of Latin and administer the department in the interest of education as they are to elect coaches and administer athletics in the interest of education. A few of the more notable coaches of the country are aware of the possibilities of athletics controlled by the faculty for educational purposes. Mr. Courtney, the Cornell coach, spoke to the point when he said, If athletics are not a good thing, they ought to be abolished. If they are a good thing for the boys, it would seem to me wise for the university to take over and control absolutely every branch of sport. Do away with this boy management. Stop this foolish squandering of money. And see that the athletics of the university are run in a rational way. Next to the physical development and the maintenance of the health of all the students and teachers of an institution, the main purpose of athletics as education is to provide recreation as a preparation for study rather than as a substitute for study. But intercollegiate athletics, having won and retained unquestioned supremacy in our colleges, students do not tolerate the idea of a conflicting interest. Even the nights preceding the great contest must be free from the interference of intellectual concerns. An editorial in one of our college weeklies makes this point clear. If a member of the faculty ventured to put the matter so extremely, he would be charged with exaggeration. But in this paper, the students naively present their conviction that even the most signal opportunities for enjoying literature must be sacrificed by the entire student body in order that they may get together and yell in preparation for their function of sitting in the grandstand. In this case, the conflicting interest appeared in no less a person than Alfred Noyes. For a geographically isolated community to hear the poet was an opportunity of a college lifetime. Yet the students wrote as follows. The Rally versus Noise Returning alumni this year were somewhat surprised to find the hall used for a lecture on the eve of our great gridiron struggle, and some were very much disappointed. The student body was only partially reconciled to the situation and was represented in great part by freshmen who were required to attend. The relative importance of intercollegiate athletics and other college affairs in the minds of students is indicated by student publications. There is no more tangible scale for measuring the interests of college youth than the papers which they edit for their own satisfaction, unrestrained by the faculty. Let's take two of the worthiest colleges as examples. The Bowdoin College Orient, a weekly publication, is typical. For the first nine weeks of the academic year, 1914-15, to 15, the Orient gave 450 inches to intercollegiate athletics. For the same period, it devoted 6 inches to art, 10 inches to social service, 13 inches to music, and 12 inches to debating. Judging from this free expression, the students rate the interest of intercollegiate athletics nearly three times as high as the combined interest of art, music, religion, philosophy, social service, literature, debating, the curriculum, and the faculty. Second in importance to intercollegiate athletics, valued at 450 inches, are dances and fraternities, valued at 78 inches. Another possible measure of the student's interest is found in Harvard of Today from the Undergraduate Point of View, published in 1913 by the Harvard Federation of Territorial Clubs. The book gives to athletics ten pages, to the clubs six pages, to debating five lines, and that student activity requires sustained thinking and is most closely correlated with the curriculum. The faculty escapes without mention. From an undergraduate point of view, the faculty appears to be an encumbrance upon the joys of college life. These publications appear to be fair representatives of their class. It is probable, furthermore, that the relative attention given by student papers to intellectual interests is a criterion of the conversation of students. Not long ago, I spent some time with the graduate students at an Eastern University. Their conversation at dinner gave no evidence of common intellectual interests. They appeared to talk of little but football games. 
On a visit to a southern state university, I found the women's dormitory in confusion. The matron excused the noise and disorder on the ground that a big football game was pending, and it seemed impossible for the girls to think of anything else. The big game comes tomorrow, I asked. Oh, no, next week, she said. Last spring, at a large university on the Pacific coast, I met one young woman of the freshman class who had already been to 31 dances that year. At a state university of the Middle West, I found that the students had decided to have their big football game on Friday instead of Saturday in order to wrench one more day from the loose grip of the curriculum. When the faculty protested, the students painted on the walks. Friday is a holiday. And it was. Intellectual enthusiasm is rare in American colleges and is likely to be rarer still if social and athletic affairs continue to overshadow all other interests. Their dominance has given many a college faculty its characteristic attitude in matters of government. They assume that boys and girls will come to college for anything but studies. They tell new students just how many lectures in each course they may escape. A penalty of unsatisfactory work is the obligation to attend all of the meetings on their schedule, and the usual reward for faithful conduct is the privilege of cutting more lectures without a summons from the dean. Always the aim of students appears to be to escape, as much as possible, of the college life provided by the faculty in order to indulge in more of the college life provided by themselves. Their inventive powers are marvelous. They bring forth an endless procession of devices for evading the opportunities for the sake of which, according to old-fashioned notions, students seek admission to college. The complacent acceptance of this condition by college faculties the pervasive assumption that students have no genuine intellectual enthusiasm tends to stagnation. In the realm of thought, some appear to have discovered the secret of petrified motion. The pronounced tendencies in higher education aggravate the disease. Feeble palliatives are resorted to from time to time. The baseball schedule in one college, after six hours of debate by the faculty, was cut down from 24 games to 22. But the bold and necessary surgeon seldom gets in his good work. When he does operate, he is hung in effigy or elected President of the United States. Concerning the policy of no intercollegiate games at Clark College, President Sanford says, Our experience with this plan has been absolutely satisfactory, and no change of policy would be considered. Doubtless some of the less intellectually serious among the students might like to see intercollegiate sports introduced. It is generally understood that in a three-year college there is not time for such extras. The faculty appear to be unanimously in favor of no intercollegiate games since the course at Clark College takes only three years. Intercollegiate contests appear to be ruled out chiefly on the ground that in a three-year course students cannot afford to waste time. But why is it worse for a young man to waste parts of three years of his student life than to waste parts of four years of it? The educational effect of our exaggerated emphasis on intercollegiate athletics is shown in the attitude of alumni. It is difficult to arouse the interest of a large proportion of graduates in anything else. At one of the best of our small colleges, in the Mississippi Valley, I saw a massive concrete grandstand. This valiant emulation of the Harvard Stadium seemed to me to typify the indifference of alumni to the crying needs of their alma mater. For these graduates who contributed costly concrete seats to be used by the student body in lieu of exercise showed no concern over the fact that the college was worrying along with scientific laboratories inferior to those of the majority of modern high schools. What could I do? the president asked. They would give the stadium, and they would not give the laboratories. There have been numerous attempts to prove that intercollegiate athletics are not detrimental to scholarship by showing that athletes receive higher marks than other students. Such arguments are beside the point, though we take no account of the weak-kneed indulgence to athletes in institutions where winning games is the dominant interest, and of the special coaching in their studies provided for them because they are on the teams, we must take account of the fact that wherever the student body regards playing on intercollegiate teams as the supreme expression of loyalty, the men of greatest physical and mental strength are more likely than the others to go out for the teams, and these are the very men of whom we rightly expect greatest proficiency in scholarship. That they do not, as a group, show notable leadership in intellectual activity seems due to the excessive physical training which, 
at certain seasons they substitute for study. But this is not the main point. A large college might be willing to sacrifice the scholarship of a score of students, if that were all. The chief charge against intercollegiate athletics is their demoralizing effect on the scholarship of the entire institution. The weaklings who have not grit enough to stand up on the gridiron and be tackled talk interminably about the latest game and the chances of winning the next one. They spend their hours in cheering the football hero and their money in betting on him. The man of highest achievement and scholarship they either ignore or condemn with unpleasant epithets. Further hindrances to scholarship are found in the periodic absences of the teams. It is said that athletes are required to make up the work they miss during their trips. But is not this one of the naive ways, whereby faculties deceive themselves? They are faced with this dilemma. Either the work of a given week in their courses is so substantial, and their own contribution to the work so great, that students cannot possibly miss it, and make it up while meeting the equally great demands of the following week, or else the work of all the students is so easy that the athletes on a week's absence do not miss much. What actually happens, year in and year out, is that the standards of scholarship of the entire institution are lowered to meet the exigencies of intercollegiate athletics. To what an illogical position we are driven by our fetish worship of college amateur athletics. We especially provide the summer vacation as a period for play and recreation, and as a time when a majority of students must earn a part of the expenses of the college year. For these purposes we suspend all classes. Yet the student who uses this vacation to play ball and thereby earn some money must either lie about it or be condemned to outer darkness. There are no intercollegiate athletics for him. He has become a professional. It matters not how fine his ideals of sport may be, how strong his character, or how high his scholarship. These considerations are ignored. The honors all go to the athlete who neglects his studies in order to make games his supreme interest during that part of the twelve months which is specifically set apart for studies. Far more sensible would be an arrangement whereby, if we must have intercollegiate athletics at all, the games could be scheduled in vacation periods, and a part of the gate receipts, if we must have them at all, could be used for the necessary living expenses of worthy students instead of being squandered as much of that money is squandered today. That this will seem a preposterous plan to those who are caught in the maelstrom of the present collegiate system need not surprise us. An accurate record of the history of intercollegiate athletics shows that, year in and year out, the arrangements desired by students are those that interfere most seriously with study during the days especially intended for study. The maelstrom of college athletics. That would not seem too strong a term, if we could view the age in which we live in right perspective, an age so unbalanced nervously that it demands perpetual excitement. We have fallen into a vicious circle. The excesses of excitement create a pathological nervous condition which craves greater excesses. The advertisement of a head-on collision of two locomotives is said to have drawn the largest crowd in the history of modern sport. Next in attractiveness is an intercollegiate football game. It is unfortunate that our universities, which should serve as balancing forces, which should inculcate the ideal of sport as a counterpoise to an overwrought civilization, are actually making conditions worse through cultivating, by means of athletics as a business, that passion for excitement which makes sustained thinking impossible, and which is elsewhere kept at fever heat by prize fights, bull fights, and blood-curdling motion pictures. But even if intercollegiate games are detrimental to the interest of scholarship, is not the college spirit they create worth all the cost? Perhaps so. A university is more than a curriculum and a campus. It is more than the most elaborate student annual can depict. Even in Carlyle's day, it was more than he called it. A true university was never a mere collection of books. It is the spirit that giveth life, and college spirit is certainly a name to conjure with. The first question is what we mean by college spirit. A student may throw his hat in the air, grab a megaphone, give three long raws, go through the gymnastics of a cheerleader, putting the most ingenious mechanical toys to shame, and it leaves some doubt whether he has adequately defined college spirit. What is this college spirit that hovers over the paid coach in his grandstand, this indefinable something, as one writer calls it, which is fanned into a bright flame by intercollegiate athletics. 
Shall we judge the spirit by its manifestations in an institution famed above all else for its winning teams and its college spirit? In such an institution not long ago, every student was cudgeled or cajoled into supporting the team, and many a callow youth acted as though he thought he had reached the heights of self-sacrifice when he sat for hours on the grandstand, watching practice, puffing innumerable cigarettes, and laying up a stock of canned enthusiasm for the big game. A student who would not support his team by betting on it was regarded as deficient in spirit. Every intercollegiate game was the occasion of a general neglect of college courses. If the game was at a neighboring city, the classrooms were half empty for two days. But the bar rooms of that city were not empty, and worse places regularly doubled their rates on the night of a big game. Some of the most enthusiastic supporters of the team went to jail for disturbing the peace. If the contest took place at home, returning alumni filled the fraternity houses and celebrated with general drunkenness. An indefinable something, consisting of college property and that of private citizens, was fanned into a bright flame in celebration of the victory. Following this came the spectacle of young men parading the streets in nightshirts. For residents of the town who did not enjoy this particular kind of spirit, the night was made hideous by the noises of revelry. All this and much more was tolerated for years on the assumption that students, imbued with college spirit, should not be subjected to the laws of decent living that govern those members of civilized communities who have not had the advantages of a higher education. The most serious difficulties between faculties and students, and between students and the police, the country over, for the past twenty years, have arisen in connection with displays of college spirit after the big game. Any college in any community might cheerfully sacrifice this kind of college spirit. But some men mean by college spirit something finer than lawlessness, dissipation, and rowdyism. They mean the loyalty to an institution which makes a student guard its good name by being manly and courteous in conduct at all times and in all places. They mean the sense of responsibility which aids a student in forming habits of temperance and industry. They mean that eagerness to make a grateful use of his opportunities which leads a student to keep his own body fit through moderate athletics, and a physical training that knows no season, is never broken. By college spirit some men mean this, and far more. They mean that loyalty to a college which rivets a man to the severest tasks of scholarship, through which he gains intellectual power and enthusiasm, without which no graduate is an entire credit to any college, and finally, they mean that vision of an ideal life beyond commencement, which shows a man that only through the rigid subordination of transient and trivial pleasures can he hope to become the only great victory a university ever wins, a trained, devoted, and inspired alumnus, working for the welfare of mankind. There is no evidence that the intercollegiate athletics of today inculcate in many men this kind of college spirit. Have I exaggerated the evils of intercollegiate athletics? Possibly I have. Exceptions should be cited here and there. But I am convinced that college faculties agree with me in my main contentions. My impression is that at least three-fourths of the teachers I have met the country over believe that the American college would better serve its highest purposes if intercollegiate athletics were no more. At a recent dinner of ten deans and presidents, they declared, one by one, in confidence, that they would abolish intercollegiate athletics if they could withstand the pressure of students and alumni. Is it therefore necessary for all institutions to give up intercollegiate athletics permanently? Probably not. Let our colleges first adopt whatever measures may be necessary to make athletics yield their educational values to all students and teachers. If intercollegiate athletics can then be conducted as incidental and contributory to the main purposes of athletics, well and good. But first of all, the question must be decisively settled. Which aims are to dominate? Those of business or those of education? And it will be difficult for a college already in the clutches of commercialism to retain the system and at the same time cultivate a spirit antagonistic to it. Probably the quicker and surer way would be to suspend all intercollegiate athletics for a college generation by agreement of groups of colleges during which period every effort should be made to establish the tradition of athletics for education. If an institution could not survive such a period of transition, it is a fair question whether that institution has any reason for survival. Typically American, though our frantic devotion to intercollegiate athletics may be, 
we shall not long tolerate a system which provides only a costly injurious and excessive regime of physical training for a few students especially those who need it least the call today is for inexpensive healthful and moderate exercise for all students especially those who need it most colleges must sooner or later heed that call their athletics must be for education not for business End of An Indictment of Intercollegiate Athletics by William T. Foster Read for LibriVox by Chris Pyle Chapter 9 of Atlantic Classics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn Chapter 9 Car Window Botany by Lida F. Baldwin One thinks of the botanist as in the silence and solitude wandering by some forest brook, or penetrating into almost impenetrable swamps, or climbing rocky mountain paths, lured on by the hope of finding some rare and curious flower. But I, in my own experience, have had some of my best finds from the windows of a railway train. It is with people sitting all around me, and the engine puffing noisily away on an upgrade, that my delighted eyes first fell on the one-flowered pyrola. The railway cutting had been made in the heart of the deep forest, and as the bank settled down, some of the rarer and shyer forest growths, such as ground pine, arbutus, and pyrola, in the course of years had slipped over the brink of the cutting and were now part way down the bank. Inside the car were tired and grimy faces. Just a few feet outside were forest freshness and greenness, and the white blossoms of the pyrola with their delicate flush. Sometimes there is no bank on either side of the railway, and from the car window one catches glimpses into the edges of forests, or looks down upon swamps and small clear ponds, or gazes across broad level meadows but more often one's view from the car window is confined to the narrow ditch of water just beyond the roadbed and to the sides of the cutting just beyond the ditch even in that confined outlook there are always possibilities and it was in just such a ditch of water as our train slowed up on the outskirts of buffalo that i saw growing great numbers of what looked like miniature calla lilies there were the same golden erect spadix the same ivory white spathe rolled back in the very curve of the spathe of the calla lily but the flower was not one quarter the size of the calla as usual my botany was in my handbag and the temptation to make a quick dash from the train to try to secure one specimen for analysis was almost irresistible but i did resist the temptation for the bank was quite steep and I never could have climbed back in time if the train had started while I was trying to secure my flower. And a lonely woman would have been left in the dusk, watching the train bearing her friends vanish in the deepening twilight. But the small white beauties were never forgotten, and years afterwards I found the flower Arampolistris growing in a swamp not many miles from my old home. One July day I traveled from Quebec to Portland on the slowest of trains. The road ran for much of the way, first on one side and then the other, of the Chaudière River, but never far out of sight of its clear brown waters. Fortunately for me, our locomotive used wood for fuel, and consequently every few hours we would stop at some great wood pile in a forest clearing while the trainmen threw a fresh supply of wood into the tender, and some of the passengers took advantage of the stop to make short explorations into the forest. About midday, as we were riding slowly along, I began to notice a pink-purple flower that was new to me, growing here and there in rather marshy places. Shortly after I had first seen the flower, the added slowness of the train showed that we were coming to another woodpile. The instant the train stopped, I was out of the cars, over the low rail fence, and picking my way carefully from grassy hummock to grassy hummock, and soon I had found a specimen. Upon analysis, it proved to be Colopagon, familiar to all New Englanders from childhood, but new to my Ohio eyes. I have never made any formal herbarium, and the only botanical record I have ever kept 
consists of the date and place of my first seeing the flower written opposite its scientific name in the margin of the pages of my old schoolgirl's copy of gray's botany but that is the only record one needs to whom all the flowers one knows are either old friends or new acquaintances in either case distinct individuals often as i have been turning the pages of the old botany in a bit of analyzing i have stopped at the page on which is written opposite the scientific name of the calopagon st henry's canada july eleventh eighteen eighty four and across the more than twenty years that lie between i smell once more the balsam of the canadian forest and see the amber-brown waters of the chaudiere river and hear the shouts of the trainmen as they throw the great sticks of wood up to the tender and giving color to all this mental picture is the pink-purple blossom of the calopagon but all trains do not have the accommodating habit of stopping for wood just after you have seen a strange flower in that case all you can do is take the best mental landmarks you can and then at the first opportunity go back for your specimen one summer i was going down on the express from philadelphia to cape may as you near the coast the road runs through a very level country and between the railway and the pine wood lies a strip of marshy ground about forty feet wide each year as i go back to the sea coast i watch eagerly for the first sight of the two characteristic flowers of the jersey coast the swamp mallow and the sebacea on this particular morning i had already seen many of the great mallows with their rose pink flowers so like those of the hollyhock that not even the most careless eye can fail to notice the family resemblance and i had welcomed them as a sure sign of the fast nearing seashore now with my face as usual close to the window i was watching the sparse marsh grass most narrowly to see if i could detect amidst it the pink star-shaped flower of the sebacea suddenly the marsh grass was set thick with spikes of yellow flowers just rising above the level of the grass there was only that one hurried look as the train went by but from that look i felt almost certain of two things the first was that i had never seen that flower before and the second that it must be close of kin to an old flower friend of mine the white fringed orchis then and there i determined to get that flower and the first thing was to make sure of its location at first this seemed almost hopeless since for miles back we had that narrow strip of marsh grass flanked by the unchanging pine woods but in a few minutes our train passed under another railway here was one landmark and in a couple of minutes more we went past a way station slowly enough for me to read the name on the board now i knew that i could find my plant the next day we took one of those local trains from Cape May, got off at the station whose name I had read, and started down the track. After a walk of a mile we passed under the other railroad, and about two miles further down the track I saw again the yellow spikes of the flower barely o'ertopping the grass. It had been a hot July morning with a sultry land breeze blowing, and as we walked the three miles down the unshaded track, we had weariedly and unavailingly slapped at mosquitoes at every step all of these discomforts together had not daunted my courage but the swarms of mosquitoes that arose buzzing at my first step into the marsh grass made me draw back to the comparative security of the railway track with the feeling that no flower could repay one for facing those swarms a second look at the yellow flowers growing not thirty feet away gave me fresh courage and i started again i was as quick as possible but when i was back once more on the track this time with my hands full of the flowers face and hands and arms were one mass of blotches from the mosquito bites upon analysis that flower proved to be the yellow fringed orchis the handsomest species of its genus and the one most closely allied to the white fringed orchis our train had been running about forty miles an hour i had never even known that there was a yellow orchid but in that one quick glance from the express train the unmistakable family look of the orchis had shown success and pleasure in car window botany depend not so much on a scientific knowledge of structural details is on the ability of the eye to recognize at a glance the characteristic effect produced by a mass of details 
It is this ability which enables you to be sure that you recognize the faces of old flower friends in the hurried glance cast from the window, which enables you to tell with certainty gray-blue clump of houstonias from gray-blue clump of hepaticas, wind-swept bank of purplish phlox from wind-swept bank of wild geranium, and it is that same ability to recognize the characteristic effect produced by a group of structural details which enables one to place without analysis the new flower in the right family i have always been secretly very proud of the certainty with which at the first sight of the yellow flower i felt that it was an orchis but all my feeling in connection with it is not that of pleasure certain flowers always recall to me certain sounds in most cases the sound associated with a flower is the one heard at the time at which i first saw the flower and to this day with the thought of the yellow fringed orchis is inseparably joined the most persistent and irritating of sounds the buzzing of the mosquito but the true history of a car window botanist is not always a record of successful achievement of the triumphant finding of his flower he also has his haunting disappointments his glimpses of strange flowers which he is never afterwards able to place one july day riding through northern new hampshire I saw just over the fence at the edge of the woods a tall plant, evidently some kind of a lily. It bore a single dark orange-red flower, which did not droop as do the flowers of the meadow lily, but stood stiffly erect. I have never seen that lily since, though never does a July come, especially if it is to be spent in a new place, that I do not think, maybe this year I will find my lily. Perhaps, after all, such experiences are not to be classed with the disappointments either of life or of car window botany. Is it not rather true that to both they give zest and expectancy? The charm of such botanizing is not alone in finding or in hoping to find some new flower. Even more enduring is the pleasure that comes from the recognition of the faces of old friends in new surroundings. An April day's journey was made one long pleasure, for the swamp-like ditch just below the roadbed shone golden with the intense yellow of the marsh marigold, an old friend from my earliest childhood. And when the railway ran halfway up a hillside, I spied, amid the dead leaves of last year, the little clumps of the clustering blue hepaticas, and recognized even in those fleeting glances the singularly starry effect produced by the numerous white stamens and as the train crossed over the creeks that flow over the rocky bottoms from out of the hemlock woods i saw in the opening up of the creek bed the juneberry trees in showers of white bloom looking doubly white against the dark green of the hemlocks just as i had seen them the day before in the hemlock woods of mill creek at my own home one of the keenest pleasures of the railway botanist comes from his enjoyment of the massed color of great quantities of flowers of the same kind. One morning our train was running along through the level Jersey country. It was at that wretched hour of the morning, when you have just taken your place in someone else's seat, while the porter is getting your own ready, and you have that all over miserable feeling that comes from a night's ride in a stuffy sleeper. In an instant all discomfort was forgotten, in the sight of a wide salt meadow, which seemed one mass of the pink swamp mallows. The gray morning mist was turned silvery white by the rising sun, and giving color to it all were the wide stretches of the flowers. It was all one shimmering mass of misty silvery gray, sunlight radiance, and rose color as delicate as that of the lining of some seashells. Once again, this time on one of our home roads near Pittsburgh, I felt the beauty of the color of great masses of flowers. The railway runs along about halfway up the bluffs by the side of the Beaver River. As we rounded a curve, the steep bank above me turned suddenly intensely red with the vivid color of the scarlet campion. Only those who notice most closely have any idea how rare a color in our wildflowers any shade of true red is. Nearly all the flowers that are commonly spoken of as red are, in reality, purplish pink or reddish lilac. Indeed, I know only two wild flowers whose color is a true red. One of these is the cardinal lobelia, whose petals are the darkest, clearest, most velvety red. 
and the other flower is the scarlet campion. The color of this latter is true scarlet, and the river bluff that June morning fairly glowed with its bloom. It is Holmes who compared the color of the cardinal flower to that of drops of blood new fallen from a wounded eagle's breast, but any true comparison for the color of this other flower must be founded on life, and on life when it is at its fullest of strength and of enjoyment. Even the most ardent of car window botanists will not claim that the only place from which the beauty of the color of flowers in mass can be appreciated is the window of a railway train. To all there come memories of fitful spring days when in long country drives they have seen partly worn out meadows and barren hillsides turned to the softest blue-gray mist by the delicate color of countless blossoms of houstonia and as they drove slowly along the partly dried muddy roads of mid-april the effect of every varying phase of the spring weather on the massed color sank slowly into their consciousness they had time to notice how blue was the color mist lying on the sheltered meadows in the sunshine and how coldly gray it grew as it crept up the hillsides across which the chill spring wind was blowing and if one lives in a country where there are chestnut ridges one looks forward through all spring to that one week of late june and earliest july when the chestnut trees will be in bloom the long staminate flowers of the chestnut are a soft cream yellow with a greenish tint and on the ridges where the trees grow in abundance the great irregular masses of their blossoming tops do not stand out against their background of the dark green foliage of midsummer but blend softly with it giving to all such an indescribable effect of lightness and airiness that the whole wooded ridge seems not to be fastened securely to the earth but to be floating cloud-like above it during that one week of the chestnut blossoming one stops at door or at window in the midst of the early morning work to watch for the moment when the first rays of the rising sun falling on the cream yellow of the chestnut tops turn them into their own deep gold and at the restful close of the day one lingers in the doorstep through the long june twilight till their blossoming tops can no longer be distinguished from the dark foliage of the other trees in the gathering darkness all one's life long the pictures of old meadow lands gray-blue with the mist of the houstonias are recalled by the alternate glinting sunshine and bleak gloom of an april day and the blossoming chestnut woods form the background to many recollections of the old home life but these pictures which have become a part of one's inmost consciousness are scarcely more dear than that one seen for a few moments of the low-lying jersey meadows flushing rose pink with the mallows in the misty morning sunshine or than that other vision of scarce a moment the river bluff scarlet with the flowers of the campion seen from the windows of a railway train end of car window botany chapter ten of atlantic classics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by allison virginia we are fearfully and wonderfully made dot tumblr dot com studies in solitude by fanny stearns gifford she was never lonely she told herself the solitude of her little old white house sitting retired from the village street among its lilac trees and syringas did not frighten or depress her she could spend a whole day of rain there seeing no one but the grocer's boy the big gray cat and occasional stooped hurrying figures out in the wet street and could come down into evening calmly busied with her enforced or chosen duties and thoughts a cloud seemed to wrap her round in many folds of seclusion till the common world of hurry and friction and loud or secret loves and hates was dim to her eyes and ears street sounds and whistles of trains at the crossroads were muffled echoes but the ticking of the tall clock the throbbing of rain on a tin roof the infrequent wind banging at a loose window the cat's creepy tread on the stairs grew rhythmic and insistent yet she was not lonely she never stopped to brood listening long to perilous voices she denied even to certain pieces of furniture books or ornaments their passive right to conjure up the spectre of her solitude 
If a room seemed too vibrant with unseen presences, she would enter it and drive out the quivering mystery with some brisk, petty business of sweeping, of shifting a picture, or rearranging a bookshelf. Often she whistled softly about her work, although there were moments when, as if by an instinct, she would stop short and glance over her shoulder to see nothing, and after that to be still. So the day would shift from grey dawn to grey dusk, and she had not allowed herself to think that she might have cause for loneliness, there in the quiet house behind its dripping lilac trees. Only in the evenings did the clock and the rain become too loud and real. Then, as she sat with a pleasant book or broidery in the yellow lamplit circle of her sitting-room, warm and quaint in its accumulation of color, old gay reds, greens, blues, tumbled together by generations of fond householders, and now subdued into harmony by years and the low light, she would find herself all at once rigid as an ice image, yet alert as a coiled serpent, listening. Listening for what? For a quick step on the flags before the door? For a long jangling peal at the bell? For a voice in the hall, or a sick querless summons from the downstairs chamber, or the scraping of a chair from above? No. She knew that she had no cause to wait for these things. There was only the rain, the clock, sleek Diogenes purring on the white fox skin, the lamp wick fretting a little to itself, and once in a while, out in the dark street, the splash and clatter of wheels, the faint wet whisper of feet that always passed her gate. So, with a self-scorning smile and a drawing of her hands across her eyes, she would take up again the book or needlework, and stop abruptly that rigid listening for sounds which never came. Long since, on her first solitary night in the old house, she had vowed to herself that she would not be sad or strange, no matter what tricks her heart and mind might play her. She would not fear memory and anticipation, but would compel them to be her servants, to keep their distance. She had been young then, and had not quite believed in her solitude. Now that she knew it through and through, she was still aware that to look too far back or too far forward would equally undo her. On these rainy nights of withdrawal, her trial times were still upon her. If she failed now, if one shudder or one tear escaped her, she was lost forever, and the White House would drive her out into a world where she could no more choose her own way of being alone. But she was not lonely, she repeated, and to prove it her mind would indulge in a fantasia of loneliness. The book would slip from her hand, and she, gazing half-hypnotized into shadowy corners, visited all the solitary people over the wide world. It pleased her to imagine homesick officers in stifling Indian bungalows, young men and girls, fresh come to the city, wandering forlorn through the glare of streets, or idling under their meager lodging-house gas-jets, light-keepers on desolate sand-dunes and rock-ledges, climbing at night twisted iron steps to tend the eternal lamp, night-watchmen pacing deserted yards and mill-corridors, sailors in the dead watch, poets and prophets trying passionately to capture the wild visions which leaped across their darkness, and most of all many women sitting as she did, in warm quaint rooms near village streets, hearing the clock tick and the rain throb. It pleased her to travel so on light unhindered wing. Almost it seemed as if her soul left her body and fared out to knock against every lonely window and to keep dumb company round every solitary lamp. And she felt that she was one of an endless army, marching straightforwardly and silently out upon their lives, stripped of the disguises that kindred and close friendships invent, and making, in return for the silence of their hearts and the smiling of their lips, only one demand of all that encountered them. That demand she never shaped of her own will. But when she had sat a long time dreaming, and had at length roused herself to make fast doors and windows, had shut the cat in the kitchen, taken her hand-lamp, and gone up the broad stairs to bed, then, in the gay, chintz-hung security of her own chamber, her throat would fashion involuntarily those words that her heart and lips refused to let themselves speak. It is all right enough, her throat would say for her, as she turned down the counterpane, untied her shoes, and wound her watch. I am quite all safe and right, but no one must ask me if I am lonely. No one must ever ask me that. Part 2 It had appeared presently that her house was haunted, though not by ghostly terrors. For herself she had only felt, at times, the vaguely imagined intimation of some presence other than her own in the quiet rooms. But she had no surer knowledge of her dimly harbored guests until a friend, wearied out with the love and care of over many babies, came to her for rest, 
and after two days of grateful idleness in her sunny window, asked suddenly, "'Miriam, whose are the voices?' "'What voices?' Miriam parried, and Lucy described them, happy, laughing voices, as of young people playing and gossiping together. "'I have heard them so often, when I was lying alone and you were out, or off somewhere. I almost asked a dozen times who was talking. They are always downstairs, or across the hall, or under the window, and they are such happy voices, young voices. Oh, very sweet and glad.' Miriam smiled and stroked her friend's nervous fingers. Lucy had always heard and seen more than other people did, and now that she was so tired, no doubt her worn-out fancy befooled her lightly. They talked it over together. Lucy, smiling at herself, nonetheless insisted, there were voices in the house. Sometime you'll hear them, too, she nodded. They're not sad or dreadful or gloomy. Oh, no, they're just young and glad. I love to hear them. And another evening, when Miriam came into the sitting-room after an errand down the street, Lucy greeted her eagerly, saying, "'It was music this time. Oh, I've heard such music. I almost went to see if someone wasn't playing. It was like a harp, I think, with a violin and piano. It was very beautiful. I thought someone must be playing until it came to me that of course it was the young people. It was happy music, just as the voices are so happy. Miriam, there are young people somehow in your house.' It became a sort of gentle, pleasant joke between them, while Lucy stayed on. "'Have you heard them today?' Miriam would ask, and sometimes Lucy replied, "'No, they must have gone off on a picnic. It was such a good day.' Or, "'Yes, they were here while you were out this afternoon. I don't see why you don't hear them.' And Miriam would shake her head. "'I never hear and see things, you know. They are your voices, Lucy. They are your babies grown up who are talking to you, even here in my old maid house.' But Lucy denied it. No, Miriam, I never heard them anywhere else. They belong to you and your house, and they mean something good and sweet and coming, not gone by. They're not ghosts. And when at last Miriam kissed her goodbye at the train, Lucy was saying, I'm glad to think of you, there in your nice sunny house, with the voices and the music. Goodbye, dear. As Miriam sat alone that evening, she wondered about those young, happy presences. She wished that she could hear them laugh and sing and play, not merely feel them blindly stirring about her. She sat, deep in reverie, smiling at Lucy's merry yet honest insistence upon her quaint little hallucination, at herself for more than half believing it. "'It is better that I never hear them,' she concluded at last, rather soberly. "'I couldn't live alone this way if I heard them. It is all well enough for Lucy, with her husband and her house full of babies, to hear things like that. Granting that she truly did, dear mysterious Lucy. But if I ever heard them, if I heard them. She glanced about the room as if she half expected to see a gay face above the piano, a bright head bending by the lamp. It would mean that I was going a little bit mad. Yes, just a little bit mad, for all that they are sweet young voices. She shivered, stood up quickly, and went over to the long mirror. Miriam, she whispered looking into the shadowy face that met hers. Lucy said those were young voices, coming voices, not gone by. But you know, Miriam, that if they are, they belong to someone else who may live in this house. To someone else, I tell you, not to you at all. Don't be a fool. You've been quite sensible so far. Don't spoil it all now. Do you hear? You mustn't even wish to hear those voices or that lovely heart music. Now you understand. Months later, she saw her friend again. "'How are the voices?' Lucy asked gaily, across the laughing baby who pulled at her necktie and snatched down her curls. "'I never heard them,' Miriam answered almost shortly. "'You know, don't you? To him that hath shall be given? Please may I hold the baby.' Part 3 Yet often, when she had spent a part of the day or evening away from home, she had a curious expectation of returning to find her house not empty and silent, but with something alive in it to greet her. She did not think of the people who had been her own in the different days so far past, nor of her living friends, nor of the young presences whose laughter Lucy had insisted upon hearing. It seemed to her simply that there was more life and motion and personality in her waiting house than just Diogenes crouching on the front porch and the kettle steaming to itself on the back of the stove. One winter evening she walked late down the village street. The moon rode high and white. Every frosty breath shone, every step creaked and crackled in the snow. Through 
the thin leafless maple trunks and lilac boughs she could see her house plainly the snowy roof glittering to the moon the low eaves ragged with silver icicles and the four yellow windows of the hall and sitting-room which she had lighted against her late return she had a definite sense of expectancy she was going back to something to somebody and found herself hurrying almost joyfully but with her hand on the gate she stopped and stared at the house as if it were strange to her an icy little stream flowed suddenly round her heart for a second all the world the moon the village the house and her own inner secret universe staggered and reeled and shook but as suddenly everything grew calm and still again the frightful chill melted from her blood the moon watched her with the same high virgin regard and the yellow windows beckoned her home she went slowly up the path and into the warm silent hall in that moment at the gate she had realized that it was only herself to whom she was going back herself who made those windows bright who piled the logs on the hearth that now she could light and sit by dreaming it was herself would be running down the stairs to greet her and fetching an apple from the pantry and listening to her story of the evening's doings it seemed to her almost as if she had become two individuals one of her went out into the village and the world the other stayed always in the little white house she would always be waiting to greet her home that was all now that she understood it it did not concern her any more she was becoming a good hermit she commented but noticed with the detachment that had grown upon her that she was not going to remember that shuddering moment at the gate she blew the fire high thinking after all there is nobody but myself who understands me much and was amused at her simple egotism part four but secretly she knew her most perilous enemy it was not sadness or selfishness or the voices or the odd wilderness of a determined recluse it was eternity there was no telling when eternity might claim her sometimes she awoke at dawn and went down into the dewy garden to work among the roses and iris and pansy plants with the birds all singing and the sun dancing like a great wise morning star the day wore on as she digged and transplanted and clipped and watered till weary a little she went into the house and took up the endless bit of sewing or some story or poem to finish and all at once in spite of the sun the earth smell the brisk village sounds beyond her garden fence she knew that her anchor dragged she had slipped her moorings in the safe harbour of time and was drifting off off into eternity then she cared nothing for rosebugs or iris roots or stockings to darn or stories to read she thought of love and sin and death of nations at war and her friends souls in joy or agony of god himself and they were all as nothing she saw the flickering garden she heard the song sparrow and the clucking hen she felt her own scrubbed and earth-stained fingers and her beating heart but these were not necessary to her she was terribly remote terribly careless and still and proud for she was in eternity what does it all matter she would murmur what if they drink and steal and sin and die or love and lose and win and die too and what of me what of me we are all in eternity god himself is in eternity but she kept the peril close none of the neighbors who hailed her on the street or gossiped on the vine-hung porch ever noticed that often as she talked she would clasp her hands with a sudden fierce little gesture as if she were holding tight to some strong arm and that in her heart she was whispering, even while the swift crooked smile danced across her lips, "'Oh, God, make me remember! Make me remember! We're in time now! Not in eternity yet! Not in eternity yet!' End of Studies in Solitude by Fanny Stearns Gifford